Matthew's Gospel tells us that at the time of judgment, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, I was naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison and you came to me. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food, or thirsty and give you drink? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you have done it to me. This passage has inspired many to seek God by serving humanity, studying the world through the signs of the times. Not least among these have been Vincent de Paul, Elizabeth Ann Seton, Thomas Dooley, and Sister Catherine. Established in 1984, the Dr. Thomas A. Dooley Award is conferred on an alumnus or alumna who has exhibited outstanding service to humankind. It is perhaps the most well-known of the association's various awards, and fitting that tonight's honoree is also a medical doctor, though not just. She celebrates this year 65 years in committed in religious community life, which in itself is a notable achievement. She entered the novitiate of the Sisters of Charity in New York at the age of 18, and as with many congregations of the time, uh, she was given the choice between nursing and education. She chose nursing and was sent to teach. <laughs> they had a lot of nurses there in there. But it's no surprise, perhaps, that she ended up in both education and healing. She was asked once, Doc, so when do you do your nun thing? <laughs> All the time, she replied. Because of course, being a doctor and being a religious are dual responses to a single call, to live out the gospel with a compassionate heart. But neither is that enough. You see, that MD was her second doctorate. After six years of doctoral dissertating, most of us would be happy to take a break. Even our Lord rested after six days. Not so for Sister Kate, who in 1973 rushed straight off from her PhD here at Notre Dame to Crichton Medical School. In fact, she went so quickly that she missed her own commencement. But we'll see something about that in a few minutes. So, two doctorates, chief of oncology, professor of medicine, all before the age of 50, would be considered by many a successful career, and they would sort of remain happy with their success at this point. But it may not surprise you to know that this is just the beginning of the story that we will hear in a moment. Aside from her professional and vocational service, which is profound, even her leisure activities would be worthy of recognition. We don't have the time to highlight all of them. We'll get to a few of them. To me, the, her service bringing her expertise in cancer care to underserved, depressed parts, the world, its Catskills, um, to those most in need, taking from a position of perhaps honor to a position of service is the most telling and the most impressive. You'll hear about several, I hope, a few of the others. Where I come from these days, it would only be possible to introduce someone of such accomplishment as the honorable, illustrious, reverend sister, professor, doctor, doctor, Catherine Siebert, never simply Sister or Dr. K, but that's how she's known. So nevertheless, I am honored this evening to present and to introduce to you this year's Dr. Thomas A. Dooley Award, 
honoree, Sister Catherine Seaford, class of 1967 and 73. Please join me in welcoming Sister Kay. I'm still in shock over all of this, but thank you. <clears throat> As uh, Tom Dooley wrote to Father Hesburgh <clears throat> from his sickbed, Notre Dame is twice on my mind and always in my heart. I was a student in microbiology here for uh, five full years and spent five summers here in biology in the master program for teachers. So, being back here after 10 years uh, of, of uh, studying is, is like home. It's a very meaningful honor and privilege uh, for me to receive the Tom Dooley Award, like a mandate to try harder to, re to relieve the poverty, pain, and burden of suffering of the patients under my care. <clears throat> The meaning of the award has helped me to uh, realize the gift and privilege and calling that God has given me. I have worked in the present and in the past with so many kind, caring, and compassionate people who have given generously to others without applause. And so I am very happy to accept this recognition in honor of all those whose name is unselfish service. My life and ideals and work have been influenced and shaped by many people, and I am grateful for those who have inspired me in religious life over the past 65 years, and also those in the medical and healing professions that I work with at Hudson River Healthcare and previously as an oncologist. I welcome some very special people here today. Sister Sheila Brosnan, a nurse who spent some time as a missionary in Chile and Guatemala, and who is currently my superior on the leadership team of the Sisters of Charity. I welcome Sister Margaret Ellen Burke, another Sister of Charity and a well-known spiritual director as well as Kathleen Carr from Notre Dame. <clears throat> Dr. Mary Trainer is a good friend and brilliant mathematician who also trained at Notre Dame. And I am grateful and blessed to have the love and support of my wonderful family, my cousin Jack Callahan and Colleen Leahy. Jack and I grew up on City Island in New York City, and we had our first job together at age 12 when we dug sandworms on the shores of City Island at low tide. And we sold the worms on the City Island Bridge for 50 cents a dozen. <laughs> Hudson River Healthcare, where I currently work, is a very special, very special place. A not-for-profit, federally qualified medical center where patients are given excellent preventive health care and treatment covering a range of services and specialties with special emphasis on the poor and the underserved. <clears throat> I welcome our medical director, Dr. Sophia McIntyre, and wonderful colleagues in leadership, Eileen McManus, Myrta, Myrta Popoka, uh, Amy <laughs> and Alida Eskivia. Dr. Phil Carter, a fellow microbiology colleague from Notre Dame, and his wife, Joan, are here from North Carolina. And father, Dr. Joseph Wilson, well known for all his innovative work while a member of the microbiology staff and germ-free labs at Notre Dame, is famous for his expertise in immunosuppression and especially the immunodeficient uh, bubble boy in Texas. <coughs> and Father Hugh Cleary of the Holy Cross community. Now a pastor in North Bennington Parish in Vermont was a chaplain for a community of cloistered sisters in the, in the Catskills, and also had a unique ministry to the migrants, especially when he said mass in the garage at the duck farm for the undocumented workers. Special blessings and <clears throat> 
A big thank you to Dolly Duffy. And Amy Bilkey from Notre Dame Alumni Association who arranged this beautiful evening. We thank you. So my life as a sister of charity and health care is quite tame uh, compared to the other sisters of charity for the last 200 years in New York did some amazing things. They were involved in the cholera epidemic in 1849, uh, staffed the military hospital of the Civil War, after the Civil War in McGowan's Pass, now Central Park, organized a smallpox hospital on Roosevelt Island in New York, founded Seton Hospital for TB patients not accepted into city hospitals, and in 1869 started the New York Foundling Hospital with $5 in a small <coughs> rented brownstone on 12th Street after infants were left repeatedly on the porch. Uh, currently, the Sisters of Charity are always trying to respond to the needs of the times, run a shelter for homeless women and children, a welcoming center for new immigrants, work with a safe house for victims of human trafficking, and started an organization and support system for the homeless in New York City to find hope, jobs, uh, dignity, and stability. <clears throat> As a community, we use the rule of Vincent de Paul, who said, the cloister is the street, and the burden of care is heavier than the bowl of soup or the loaf of bread that you give to the poor. Patients have asked me, when do you do your nun thing? <laughs> well, if you try to help people and love God, it's all the same. Uh, if you think of the two great commandments, love God with all your heart, and all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor. Uh, Pope Francis wrote in Laudato Si, reminds us that this is our planet, and to take care of everyone and everything, the air above, the water that flows. Am I my brother's keeper? Should I care about the jobless, the hungry, the people on the margins, the people across the borders? the unborn, do I, do we, have an obligation and a duty to bring others hope and caring? And do we really live in the shelter of one another? <clears throat> As a high school biology teacher and finishing my master's in biology in a teacher training program with courses for five summers at Notre Dame, one of my professors the late Father Dahl from the Holy Cross community uh, wrote to the Sister of Charity president to say that I really belonged in the research field <clears throat> and that I could go right into the doctoral grant program in microbiology. I could not accept the offer that year because of my contract commitment to teach high school biology that September, but I thought it would be a good option if I started getting stale in high school and came to Notre Dame in 1968 to begin a five-year study and research in microbiology, now under the famous, now deceased virologist, Dr. Morris Pollitt. Uh, one of the pictures up there on the left, uh, that was at an electron microscope, and uh, I worked with Dr. Kajima, who was at, in microbiology, and we studied the membranes uh, of um, patients or an animal model with lupus to find out why patients with lupus went into kidney failure. <clears throat> but I worked with the deceased virologist, now deceased virologist, Dr. Morris Pollard. He had a brilliant mind and was working on numerous projects, among which is the HPV vaccine. We were making vaccines then by contract. Uh, carcinogenicity of sodium nitrates, if you eat bologna, you get some nitrates and it's carcinogenic. The hormone, and on the hormone influence on prostate cancer. <clears throat> it was only later when I was doing research at NIH uh, that I realized that to study the control of cancers and the effectiveness of new drugs, you have to be able to grow the cancer in culture or in a mouse or an animal model in order to test out new treatments. 
And up to that point, uh, prostate cancer was very behind breast cancer because no one before Morris Pollitt had been able to grow prostate cells outside of uh, you know, human beings and uh, could not grow them in culture or in the animal model. And he was able to do that. And so it was a marked advance in prostate cancer. <clears throat> he was a great advocate for his students, and they would just say the name Pollitt as a mentor, and they obtained a position at a prestigious research institute. Notre Dame is a place of heart and spirit. And the football pep rallies in the old field house, the tug of war between the dorms when the elephant joined the other team, the grand entrance of Dr. Emil Hoffman, sometimes on horseback to deliver his notorious Friday morning chemistry exams, the primates that tricked the researchers, the guinea pigs that escaped and ate the cables of the electron microscope. I think they were your guinea pigs, Phil. <laughs> The students who had continuous readings of Shakespeare and the Quad as a fundraiser for local charities. The joke of me trying to do physical chemistry after taking my last course 20 years previously. At Notre Dame, there was always the discovery and the thrill of learning science, and the, the ideas were intoxicating. Where but at Notre Dame could you be exploring Mars in a telescope and shortly thereafter, find yourself in a mosquito library, a mosquito library, studying various types of malaria and vectors that lead to the death of several billion people annually. While doing research on the immunologic changes that occur prior to and the development, prior to and after the development of some lymphomas in a germ-free model. I realized that God was calling me to practice medicine as an oncologist, rather than stay in the research field. And after many hundred walks around the lakes here, I spoke to the president of the Sisters of Charity that it was clear that I should go into medicine and help people with cancer. She said, just do it, Kay. Anything else? <laughs> I thought of the years of study ahead, and I still have a little stone, speak, that one of the sister student artists at Lewis Hall gave me and painted. And on this stone, she painted, you are weak, but have you ever measured the power of God? Everything fell into place. Uh, Creighton Medical School said that I could go into second year because I had so many courses from Notre, Notre Dame provided <laughs> that I take all the tests for first year during second year for their accreditation and take anatomy and neuroanatomy lab. But Indiana University had 12 of their medical students at Notre Dame with teachers and professors who are on both faculties. <clears throat> So I made a deal with Indiana U and went out there on my bicycle in the winter, bought a little car and helped them with their micro lab at Indiana U. And they said in return I could take their anatomy course and their anatomy lab. So several times a week at 10 o'clock p.m. for two semesters, the Notre Dame security guards would walk me from the microbiology building to the Quonset huts at the end of Douglas Road where they had the six cadavers so I could study the bodies to pass the Friday morning written and practical exams. I bought a $600 Volkswagen with no heater or defroster and a rusty bottom and it got me to Nebraska where in the winter they worried more about the cows and the cars. <clears throat> I had the car for several years until it self-destructed and the battery fell off the bottom. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> The American Association of Uni University Women uh, picked up the tab for my, you know, my medical school first year. And in the third year, we started the clerkships. And Creighton tested me also. I was assigned to the maximum security prison for my psychiatry rotation. And the first prisoner I saw said that the last woman he saw, he cut up and put in a trunk. <laughs> And for OB, I was assigned to a very, very busy city hospital where the other medical students put a sign on the common call room, five guys and the nun. 
<laughs> I was fortunate to complete a six-month rotation in adolescent oncology at St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis. And there's a special heartache that you get in oncology, and the heartache started at St. Jude's. I remember a teenage boy who called his patient friends to his room for a, pop a popcorn guitar party the night before he was going to have his leg amputated for osteogenic sarcoma. He sang at the top of his lungs, sunshine on my shoulder makes me happy. I stood in the doorway with tears in my eyes and the saying goes, don't just stand there, do something. But sometimes it's better to just just stand there and don't do something. <clears throat> it's a wonderful privilege to be a doctor, to make a fundamental difference in people's lives, in a profession where one's heart is exercised equally with one's head. <clears throat> the creative fire within allows the work that one loves and the gifts that one have contribute to people in a special way. <clears throat> The physician can be excused for not being able to cure a patient, or not failing to receive to relieve suffering. Albert Schweitzer said, pain is a greater lord and master than death itself. The physician-patient relationship must be sealed by understanding, kindness, mutual trust, and respect. Making a correct diagnosis is a surprisingly complex process of integrating experience <clears throat> with a flood of information, a process that evolves over a physician's lifetime. Besides giving compassion and hope, physicians also give counsel. And this is an art. You do not substitute your judgment for that of the patient or family, but work in partnership with them to craft, craft the best decision together after sharing the accurate facts. I took my first medical position as a medical oncologist at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford, which is part of the University of Connecticut healthcare system where I did my medical residency. I then worked as chief of medical oncology at Bailey Seton Hospital in Staten Island and then a Lady of Mercy Medical Center in the Bronx, now part of Montefiore. <coughs> When a physician recruiter invited me to restart an oncology program in Sullivan County, where they had no oncologist 10 years previously, I thought I could help more people than in New York City, where there are many excellent oncologists. <clears throat> At that time, when I went there, people who had resources and were able to drive two to three hours to New York City received contemporary oncology care. But for those who could not travel to the city or had no resources, there was no oncologist in Sullivan County for consultation or chemotherapy. There are still no radiation oncologists or radiation facilities in the county. With a lot of support and hard work, the oncology program was certified with commendation, and I worked at the Catskill Hospital solo for three years as an oncologist, and then others joined me, and for a total of 15 years, I was chief of oncology there. The diagnosis of cancer is often a chaotic and tumultuous event, and can trigger the fear and despair in the strongest of us. It is a thief that steals the time of one's life. Cancer treatments often have the potential to cure various cancers or prolong life in others, but the treatment is sometimes difficult and debilitating, and it can cause a patient to feel powerless. It's a privilege to walk beside patients on their journey. It's a, a symbol of God's love to be faithful to the end and to try as much as humanly possible to be totally available. One celebrates the victories and supports the patients and the disappointments in a struggle uh, with a disease that is so autonomous. The will to live, thrive, and survive is so basic that when extended life is not possible, a tsunami of emotions are released. 
while respecting personal dignity as well as cultural differences and religious beliefs, I would try to help the patient find peace and meaning in life. A young pharmacist who had AIDS and lymphoma came to my office some years ago for an evaluation. He knew the gravity of the situation and sat together with his partner across from his mother in the waiting room. His mother was unaccepting of the reality of the situation. I told the patient in private that he had reached maximum benefit from any available medical treatment. I asked what he feared most. What was he afraid of? The pain, separation, financial concerns. He whispered the other side. I said that um, there's a loving God on the other side. He said, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And shortly thereafter, he died, but in, in peace. <clears throat> it is a privilege to be with people as they take their last breath on earth. It is a moment as full of mystery as the first breath, and you can feel the holy. At the bedside of the dying, I feel that I'm holding one hand and God is holding the other. One becomes well aware that a physician is a steward of life and not a master of life and death. To be an oncologist, though, often the oars of one's labors are heavy. One must weigh all the treatment options to judge whether they would save or improve life or just prolong the dying process. Sometimes would, patients would ask, a doctor, if you were me, what would you do? A chemo or no chemo, transplant or no transplant, respirator or no respirator, investigational therapy or palliative care. I spent many hours often walking in the woods, thinking and praying to give good counsel. I have been working part-time for the last uh, 12 years as an internist for Hudson River Healthcare, which is a nonprofit, federally qualified health center giving primary and preventive health care to patients in Monticello. And also, there are Hudson River Healthcare is in about 25 sites in the New York City area. We take care of the insured and the uninsured, uh, Medicaid and Medicare migrants undocumented, the homeless, and anyone who needs care, regardless of ability to pay. <clears throat> I learn more and more each day about the poverty trap for people and their families. Many of the immigrants I see work long hours, uh, force feeding ducks or degutting chickens. And in Monticello, where I work, there are a few jobs, and depression, hopelessness, and apathy are common. People sometimes escape from the reality of poverty by using drugs or alcohol. One of my patients lived in a small garbage enclosure and just came out to collect beer cans and soda cans to buy food and beer. When I asked why he did not have food stamps, well, he said, well, he was turned down because he had no address. A woman last summer was living in her car with Hydro, her pit bull. When she returned about two weeks later, she had lupus and she had many medical problems. And when she returned two weeks later, she said, you look worried that I was living in my car. She said she found somebody and he gets out of jail on Thursday. But she said she had to dump hydro. I also mentor a physician's assistant in Goshen, New York, where our office treats mostly undocumented farm workers. One day, when I was seeing patients alone because the physician's assistant was on vacation, the nurses uh, told me that there was a man who was soaking wet standing at the door waiting to be seen. The man who said he had a drinking problem, which was evident, uh, told us that he sold his cell phone for money to travel to the Goshen Farms because he was told that migrants there have housing. He took a job, but housing was not included. After three days of pulling up onions, he was hungry 
and someone gave him a fishing line to go to the river and catch some fish to eat. He was drinking and fell in the river, hurt his back, and now could not pull up the onions. I said that the best plan would be to drive him to the hospital where he could be admitted to rehab and then the rehab a pro a program would find him housing. He refused, so we gave him some ibuprofen, some food, and an invitation to come back. So as the years pass on in my medical career, I have even, I've, I've become even more aware of what I cannot do. It is learning to work with the movement of God, a, so a sort of drawing on God's energy. As it says in the book of Sirach, healing itself comes from the Most High, like a gift from a king. There is an ever intense search to find out what has heart and meaning in life. We need that inward gaze so that when we look outward, we will be able to see and share with others which has true value. As said by Saint Exupery and the Lepre Le Petit Prince, it is only with the heart that one sees rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. We take the gifts we have received and give them back as a gift, a sort of harvesting of one's life. So one must look through the front view window with the wisdom and experience of the rear view window. The same loving God who has brought me to this time and place will guide me for the rest of my life with the time I have left. The canvas of one's life is not done until you paint all the finishing touches. I hope the lights stay on as the batteries go low. There is true happiness if the things we believe as, are the same as the things we do. I am continually nourished by the beauty of nature and try to take big bites of beauty every day. Beauty inspires us with a power that unlocks the yearnings of the human heart and allows us to reach beyond to ultimate beauty. And friends, they are the masterpieces of your life and of my life. And, and thank you very much for honoring me and thank you all for coming. So let me show you some pictures because my friends know that my passion is really for dogs. And if I was younger, I think I'd go to vet school. I really would. Less paperwork, the whole thing. But. <laughs> Previous, we'll go to the previous picture, uh, the previous one that was up there. Yeah. On the top, you see uh, Father Mongoy, a former president. Um, he found out at uh, I was honored at a at a New York celebration about ten years ago, and uh, although I received my diploma, I'm not a fake. I didn't stay for graduation because I was already in my Volkswagen driving to Creighton. So um, my niece arranged for me to get a hood, and I was hooded by uh, Father Monk Malloy, which was, uh, was very touching for me. And then uh, you see the, uh, I did some work on electron microscopy, and uh, I guess what's one of the things, the opportunities here at Notre Dame, I mean, how many universities have a student electron microscope? And I mean, I learned all about lupus and the, kidney disease of lupus before I even went to medical school. And the next is a patient I'm seeing at Hudson River Healthcare, and unfortunately, I lost her uh, limb. And um, we we're discussing uh, life. And the next fellow is a child at St. Jude's. And I took care of mostly adolescents, but because of call and all that, you took care of the little kids uh, also. And on the next slide, <coughs> Uh, so, uh, actually, especially in oncology, you need to uh, 
connect with life. And uh, I don't know how it uh, happened, but I started to uh, train throwaway dogs. And I always uh, trained their throwaway dogs. And this dog that you see in the first picture, he was chained to an outhouse in the Sullivan County and uh, in a, to a trailer and the owners they had coon hounds and raccoons and they didn't want this poor thing that was infested with hook arms. So I took him and trained him to be a certified therapy dog and he went with me to camp for kids with cancer on Shelter Island, the American Cancer Society camp. And the, the kids couldn't care less if I came, but they wanted Chester Amadeus, was his name, Chester Amadeus. And he would actually do consults for the homesick kids. They were like, I have a consult in cabin six and he would go there and they'd cry into his fleece and whatever. And so that's just Amadeus. And uh, the, uh, then the last picture here is also just Amadeus at camp. We went there for five years. And the uh, boy with the blonde hair at the end, he died shortly after the picture was taken. And uh, he would talk to me about the tumor that had gone to his brain. And his mother told me that he died with the dog's picture above his head. And in the uh, center uh, shows, uh, we have uh, actually a gardening project at Hudson River Healthcare. And uh, there's a lot of community involvement and we get the Head Start children to start the seedlings for our gardening project. And so uh, I'm there picking up our seedlings for our, our garden. Okay. And this shows our uh, staff when I said that I accept the award for all of uh, the people that I work with and who have helped me over the years uh, show unselfish service. This is, uh, shows the staff, the current staff that I'm working with, and these are the most unselfish people that you could meet. We have people with all kinds of uh, needs, uh, you know, out of jail, out of recovery, no money, and uh, we're like family to them, and everybody pitches in, and so I accepted the award in the name of all of the uh, uh, staff at Hudson River Healthcare work very hard to meet the needs of the people. Amen.